the desert is calling. I remember that, that December night. It was cold. It had a bite to it. I had received notification late afternoon that my box had arrived, and I couldn't get away just yet because of class. I was only 19, well, 20 at that time. And so after class was over, I got home, did what needed to be done. The snow had fallen that afternoon, and I didn't want to risk losing my parking spot, so I decided to walk to church a few kilometers away. Now, walking to church was nothing new necessarily for me. Like many of you, I grew up in the church, but my church was located in the country that shall not be named in this land, (laughs) the one located a little bit south of here. I grew up in the middle of it, in the middle of nowhere, in a town of 13,000 people. And I am proud to say that I made the most Sunday school teachers quit because I was the honoriest child in that congregation. But during puberty, something switched and I found home at the church, and it became something new. But when I went to college, I swore off my religion, and I said I want to party these years, and party I did. But not like some of you who actually did party. I was at the right spaces. The ambulances were called at the parties because people were doing things they shouldn't be doing to the point of harm. But I, no matter what I did, even staying up till 5 in the morning, would wake up at 9 a.m. on Sunday morning ready to go to church. Yes, I'm a nerd. And so soon I found myself back in the halls of sanctuaries, I guess, and went to church, a United Methodist church. Shortly after, therefore, I conceded, okay, I'll be a minister. You see, that wasn't always the plan. In fact, since since childhood, since second grade, I knew I wanted to be a school teacher. I started tutoring my peers, in fact, in second grade. Started grading papers in third grade. Teacher's pet does not even begin to describe my status in school. I knew I wanted to be a teacher. And I got to high school, and I got to computers, and I learned quickly and very, yeah, quickly how to use computers. And so I knew I wanted to teach business, accounting, marketing, business law. Those things come naturally for me. I'm intrigued by those things. And so I went to college pursuing a degree in teaching. And yet I was so unsatisfied. And yet church on Sunday morning filled me with something that I still cannot articulate to this day. And so I found myself at the ripe age of 20 as a local licensed minister for the United Methodist Church. And what that means is I could do everything a minister can do, marry, bury, baptize, and communion, at the church that I was employed. It was a large church. I had a full-time senior minister, a full-time associate minister, and then I was the third associate minister part-time. It was a glorious time. But it was at this church that I received the news that my box had arrived finally after months of waiting, and it was my robe. My beautiful, beautiful clergy robe, custom made for me. I remember putting it on the first time. Never seen this, have you? Behind the scenes actions here. And I know in this context, the white alm is what you see many clergy wear. But in the United Methodist Church, and even in the United Church of Canada, black robes are worn at times. As Beth says, this is more academic, Joseph, but that's fine by me, and we'll get there, but fine by me. I can wear the academic robe. But I love my clergy robe and how beautiful it is, and yet at the same time, so humbling to wear. It was during this time that I met him. He was beautiful. He was my age, Christian, religious, smart, intelligent, funny, charming. Sure, I have charm, I've been told in my life, but his charm always could do magical things. The law would be one thing, and what he was able to get away with was amazing. Rules were always bent in his presence. 
And soon I found that a friendship turned to more. But when I told him, I told him the truth, his response was that our God had ordained our friendship so I could be saved from fires of condemnation. This didn't go over so well with me, if you can imagine that. And I was quite heartbroken on many fronts. You see, in the United Methodist Church in the States, and well, actually the globe, we'll get to the Methodism here in a second, but in the United Methodist Church, openly self-avowed and practicing homosexuals are incompatible with Christian teaching. You see, I wasn't just choosing a life or sin. I was sin. I was completely incompatible with God. Where do you go when you're incompatible with God? To say those those months were dark is an understatement. And if you want to talk about control issues, boy, I wanted to control people. Accept me. Welcome me. You were my home. And now you have displaced me. And walk past me in Walmart. That's where I'm from. Walk past me in Walmart and act like you don't know who I am. One thing I've learned about control is a Star Wars quote, the best theological movie I go to always. This is getting nerdy, folks. The quote is Princess Leia to a bad dude. She says, the tighter you make your grip, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. Unnerd version goes like this. The tighter you try to force something, the more the things you care about will slip away. And so, in a weekend, a particular weekend, a particular dark weekend, where the sun sh was up, but I didn't see it, and fresh air was available, but I didn't get it, locked away in a lowly apartment, I emailed a seminary professor that I knew, the smartest man I knew. I wasn't in seminary. I was still an undergrad. So I emailed him and told him what was up. And his response was, well, Joseph, Joseph, clearly your God is too small. Clearly you need to open your eyes to see how wonderfully you are made. And I was baffled. <laughs> The church is supposed to tell me I'm incompatible, and yet the smartest, wisest man, Christian man, tells me my God is too small and that there is room for me. So I completed, uh, well, in that time, lots of things were going on during that time. I quit my church job and got a master's in educational technology because when all else fails, go to school. So I did. I got a master's. After that, they hired me full time. But I knew as, uh, during those two years, well, additionally, I had another mentor who told me a John Wesley quote. John Wesley is the founder of Methodism. He had a quote that said, Once, uh, preach faith until you've got faith. Once you've got it, preach it. A.K.A. fake it till you make it. So my mentor said, well, the answer, Joseph, clearly, go preach. And so I did. I started preaching and got a job at a church. But I knew I wanted to go to the seminary. I wanted the knowledge my minister friends had. And so I applied and ultimately went to Boston University School of Theology. Its name to fame is many, actually. It's the first seminary, uh, Methodist seminary in the United States. It also made Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. the doctor. It also uh, was the first place the woman uh, was ordained. woman that was ordained came from that school named Anna Howard Shaw and currently has a good number of queer folk because it's Boston University. So I was not alone in my ventures. In seminary, I questioned, questioned where my belonging was because, well, technically the church said I couldn't do this. The church 
that I grew up in said no. So I went to a a professor of mine in seminary and I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to leave the Methodist church because I don't want to be one of those gays that do that. They go in, they cry, and then they go find someone else. I want to stay. I want to fight. I want to change it. And I did. I I didn't change it. No, I didn't. I worked, though, to change it for Reconciling Ministries Network, the organization in the Methodist church trying to make it more inclusive. And perhaps you've heard the news recently that the United Methodist Church is not only uh, not welcoming towards all, but super not welcoming towards all. It's gone even worse for us. Prayers for, for my, my family, but my family there in the Reconciling group. But the professor told me, well, you seem to care a lot about education, and looked at my background, So she said, why don't you get a PhD? And she knew I taught university before, and so I was inclined to that. She said, why don't you get a PhD in not religious education, but in education doing theological work? Okay. So I emailed out a bunch of professors all over the U.S., and I said, I love God, and I love teaching, and I want to make the two work together. How can I do that? And a person replied back from UBC, University of British Columbia, here. Here's where you do that. And they paid me to come, so I said, okay, if you're going to pay for me to come, I'm there. Let's see what happens. And I quickly landed in Vancouver, and I googled United Methodist Church, and I discovered you're not going to find a United Methodist Church in Canada. For those of you who know already, the United Church of Canada is the merger between the Methodist, the Congregationalist, and the Presbyterians back in 1925. And so I started attending the United Church irregularly when it came time. Well, last year, as I was writing my dissertation, it's written officially now, revisions are for tomorrow, but it's written at least, but I was writing all last year, and I found myself once again discerning what is next. PhDs are considered terminal degrees, which means you can't go, well, I'll go back to school now. It's over for me. So I got to figure out what I'm doing with my life. (laughs) Am I going to be a professor or am I going to do something else? And in Missouri, where I come from, I walked sidewalks and, and wooded areas. In Vancouver, I get beaches and mountaintops. And I cried out, God, what is next for me? And something moved inside of me that I just couldn't let go. Church. Church. And the United Church of Canada is a denomination that allows queer folks to be ordained. We are an affirming congregation. We welcome all people regardless of sexuality and gender identity. And so... The robe. The robe is able to reappear. You see, for so many people, and this is not to to put down anybody, ministry is a calling. It is, folks. It's a sacred and holy, holy position to have. It's hard. It's a lonely path. It's not something that's easy. It's taken me months to surrender to, quite frankly. And yet what you see before me, well, what you see before yourselves, is resurrection. This job is not just a ministry job. This job is a resurrection to something that I thought wasn't possible. I contacted a a mentor of mine, a lesbian clergy person in the state. So the United Methodist Church may say we don't have let queer people, we have queer people all over the place. You can't kick us out. So she's in the system, and I asked her, but I I don't necessarily know if I want to leave the Methodist church yet. And she said, Joseph, Joseph, aren't you the one who always speaks of resurrection? A common theme for my messaging. She said, did you know that the United Church of Canada is the only progressive thinking denomination with Wesleyan roots in North America? 
This is not you turning your back on the Methodist church. This is you being resurrected to serve as you have been called to all of your life. Resurrection. It's possible. And this is the living proof. This is not just a symbol or a sign of clergy. This is a sign for me that resurrection is possible, that those in the United States and around the world, quite frankly, the queer individuals who are grieving the United Methodist Church's current decisions, there is still possibility for their ministry. And for that, I thank God. But for their pain now, I cry to God. No matter where you find yourselves this morning, may you hear the message of resurrection. It is possible, and it is coming. But today, as we've sung about and I've spoken about, today is not a day of resurrection. That's going to come in a few weeks. Stay tuned. Today, today is a day where we go into Lent, into the desert, a time where we look at ourselves. Who are we? In a few moments, you are going to be invited to the communion table. Now, this is actually my favorite thing I get to do as minister I, I can't explain, I mean, I can, but that's a whole other sermon of why it's so important to me. But what, what I note this morning, two things. The communion table calls us and summons us like the desert does. It doesn't care what you're wearing. It doesn't care what you've done or haven't done. It doesn't care about your name or your status. The table only cares that it's you who will come fully. That means for good and for ill. Because that person who we don't necessarily want to admit is inside of us is the one that God is calling for, the beautiful selves of humanity that hold so many possibilities. And yet you also do not come to the table alone. As you walk forward, I invite you to look in front of you. Look to your sides as you walk and look behind you and know that while we are in the desert together during this Lenten season, well, we're together, just that. We are not alone in the desert. The desert itself is barren, but we have community. And the invitation outside of this space, outside of the table, as your new minister of community life, is I want to hear your story. You got shame? I got plenty. You got grief? I single-handedly solved droughts with my tears. (laughs) You got a humiliation? Go back to my first two weeks here, if you remember right. (laughs) Your stories are welcomed here. And if Beth was here, she would say the same. Beth and I are here to hear your stories, to walk with you. And sometimes we might have some answers. We've studied some things. But other times, we'll grapple with you. The mysteries, the doubts, the confusions, the questions, we do that together in this space. We don't shy away from those challenging moments. We welcome them and embrace them and hold them, knowing that something greater than ourselves hold us even. And so we make our way to the table. But I ask you, as we prepare, what in your life is preventing you from being who God is calling you to be, from being your true self, Sometimes that means losing stuff. We are, after all, walking towards the cross in this journey. Other times, it's picking something up. Acts of service, 
meditation, reading scripture. Perhaps we in this community can be of help to you as you seek that journey. I'm going to invite Lonnie to come up and just play something simple as we reflect on what do you want to bring to this table today and leave behind in this space. What would you like your Lenten journey to be this year?